Hi, I'm Kevin, and this is Raised on Film. Cinema is unique from other art forms because it is unrivaled in portraying both untamed fantasy and stunning realism. Before the language of cinema had developed, films emulated theater, often having single setups on a flat proscenium background and actors performing as if for a large house. As time went on and the language of cinema developed, sound came into the mix, then color, and cinema slowly transitioned away from the theatrical model and became something distinct. Interestingly, the coin completely flipped as theater now largely attempts to emulate film. As the language of film developed and became its own, so did a specific performance style. The large theatrical gestures, voices, and characters were gone for the most part. Comedy moved away from broad slapstick and buffoonish characters to more dialogue-heavy, drier wit, with exceptions, of course. Yeah. Cinema leaned into its inherent intimacy. Projected onto a 40-foot screen, the smallest facial expression reads as large as a full-body gesture on a stage. Developments in audio technology allow whispers to resonate like choral screams. Realism found its footing in cinema, and it has since become the standard. And it makes sense. Film is better suited for the suspension of disbelief than any other medium. You can see it and hear it, after all. It's less work for an audience to imagine characters in a desert in a film set in an actual desert than on a stage with a cardboard cactus. And we've seen with great success over decades the profundity of capturing real moments on screen. So films are the medium of realism. But what does that mean? What are the shortcomings of that, and how is that misinterpreted? Realism in film has lost its way, and it's about time that we suss it out. So, to do so, let's talk about Spotlight and A Woman Under the Influence. Spotlight is a 2015 procedural about a news team in Boston investigating systemic child abuse within the Catholic Church. The film is inspired by a true story and is partially accountable to the people and events on which it is based. It takes place in several drab locations, the emotions are small, the relationships are subtle, and the subject matter is often inferred or tiptoed around. The film does everything to show the events as they happened, as they unfolded, almost as if the movie itself was a newspaper article about the story. Dry, objective, unopinionated. But it's not. These are actors playing characters, speaking words scripted by a writer to have maximum dramatic effect. The result is a film that looks, sounds, and feels distinctly uncinematic, and ignores one of the fundamental questions of any piece of art. Why this medium? In this case, why film? Why does Spotlight need to be a film? Why couldn't it be a book? or a television show, or an article in a newspaper? What is it about Spotlight that necessitates it being a film? What elements of the language of cinema are used to raise the story to the point that no other medium could reach? Let's return to cinema's inherent strengths, intimacy. Spotlight is decidedly unintimate. It's subtle and underplayed, but that's not intimacy. We never get to know any of the characters outside their work personas, and we never really see anything intimate about them except for the very occasional slight break in the facade. How about visuals? Does Spotlight use inventive or evocative cinematic techniques to heighten the story's effectiveness? It's not much to look at, and I would dare say that visually it commits one of the greatest sins a film can in that it looks boring. The camera work is simple and unobtrusive, keeping the audience at arm's length, which effectively keeps the film objective without asserting a visual style of its own. But it goes so far as to defeat the purpose of the film being a film at all. It was challenging to pick out clips from the film for this video because visually the film is so uncompelling. I mean, see for yourself. Director Tom McCarthy puts great effort into making the film feel as real as possible and borrows heavily from HBO's The Wire, which he was a cast member of. He's attempting to emulate the hyper-realist, almost voyeuristic feel captured in The Wire, but it doesn't quite work. For one, The Wire's cast is made up largely of Baltimore natives, many of whom had never acted, giving the show a neo-realist feel. Secondly, The Wire is 60 hours long, meaning that all of the complicated and subtle nuances between characters can burn slowly to their culmination in ways two hours just doesn't permit. 
And thirdly, despite its hyper-realist feel, The Wire deals with huge emotions, sky-high stakes, and profound discoveries with massive implications. It would not work in any other medium. The Wire must be a television show. It could not be a film, a book, or a radio show. Conversely, Spotlight is only two hours long, features only professional actors, and deals with small, subdued emotions. Take this scene right here. Mark Ruffalo's character has been waiting on pins and needles for over 20 minutes of the film's runtime to access these documents that he's been promised will blow the lid off the entire investigation. And when he finally gets the records at long last, this is how we are shown. Robbie, it's incredible. Law knew about Gagan for years, no question. There's a letter to Law from a woman, Margaret Gallant, who lived in Jamaica Plain in the early 80s when Gagan was there. Through voiceover paired with footage of the cab that he is in. It's so blasé that it completely takes the air out of the moment. The visuals do nothing at all to illuminate this groundbreaking information. Let's play the scene again and take the video out completely. Robbie, it's incredible. Law knew about Gagan for years, no question. There's a letter to Law from a woman, Margaret Gallant. Notice any difference? Or are you just desperate to know what traffic in Boston is like on this particular day. To the film's credit, it smoothly transitions into Ruffalo giving the information to his team, which culminates in the most and arguably only emotionally charged scene in the film. It's time, Robbie! It's time! They knew, and they let it happen to kids! And maybe this is how it happened. It makes perfect sense that the person on which the character is based would tear open the file immediately and read it over the phone in the back of a cab, but it doesn't make for good cinema. They already transition into him finishing the document in person, so why not just have him open the envelope with his whole team? It would make for a more significant, more profound moment of shared discovery and give the actors a scene to really sink their teeth into. But maybe this is exactly how this moment happened in real life, in which case... Kudos to the film for being true to the source material, even at the expense of the story's impact. Would you like some spaghetti? Spaghetti? Yeah, it's cool. Do they all want spaghetti? Yet? Yeah. This is John Cassavetes' 1974 film, A Woman Under the Influence. The film follows the trials and tribulations of a family coping with mental illness when our understanding of such things was uh, even worse than it is today. The film is small and completely fictional. The emotional beats, gestures, and size of the performances are emphatically larger and more expressive than Spotlight. Yet somehow it feels more true to life than the hyper-realism of Spotlight and other similar films. This is primarily due to Cassavetes' penchant and insistence on allowing actors the space to make the characters their own and focus more on characters' inner turmoil than, for example, their jobs. It is also partly due to the excellent performances of his actors, in this case Peter Falk and American cinema's best-kept secret, the incomparable Gina Rowlands. You and I know. See that, Nick? That's how close we are. And they can pull us apart, they can force us apart. The film does not attempt to make a grand statement about the state of the world or humanity at large, but instead tells a minimal and intimate story of family strife. In doing so with such commitment and specificity, the film manages to do just that, make grand statements about the human condition and the times we are living in. As a result, we see, specifically from the time the film was made, the blind spots of gender norms, shortcomings in personal and systemic understanding and treatment of mental health, social status and group dynamics, the timeless perversions of love, the universal emotions which are the underpinning of all human existence, and so, so much more. I'll be down on a railroad track for you. If I made a mistake, which I did, I'm sorry, but so what? What's the difference? I love you. Now relax. Come back to me. But wait a second. This film is fiction. Spotlight is non-fiction. How can a fiction film teach us more about real life than a film about real life? This is where the lie about realism comes to light. Spotlight and films of its ilk are not realism. 
They are pedestrian. They attempt to emulate the nonchalant, low-stakes, safe, boring world that most of us feel comfortable inhabiting. Keeping the audience at arm's length makes a certain sense when dealing with subject matter that is as disgusting as systemic child abuse. Its pedestrianism gives us the distance to understand it cerebrally without dealing with it emotionally unless we choose to. In a way, the distance Spotlight creates from the audience serves as a fourth wall, protecting us from anything too real. A woman under the influence, however, grants us no quarter. It stares the insecurities, shortcomings, and ugly ludicrousness of humanity right in the face and doesn't let up. It often doesn't make logical sense, but it makes complete emotional sense. And it plays at such a pitch that it is thoroughly exhausting to behold, in the best way. Events unfold in ways that on paper would simply not track, but given the time and space, make perfect sense through the unreasonable and irrational lens of human behavior. And in so doing, the film can take complete fiction and create something tangible, more real than real. I've heard before that the craft of acting is the art of lying, but that is incorrect, or at least a one-way path to a lousy performance. Acting is the act of telling the truth. The role, the character, and the words on the page, if there are any, are just guideposts towards truth. In the case of a film like A Woman Under the Influence, it must be seen to be believed, and it must be felt to be understood. While a critical story to tell, Spotlight does not need to be seen to be believed. It does not need to be felt to be understood. It does not need to be a film at all. Spotlight, as is presented, would work just as well as a radio play, a book, or a series of newspaper articles. Or I could just tell you right now, the Catholic Church has been perpetrating systematic child abuse for decades, if not centuries, if not millennia. There. That's all the film is about. You don't need to see it now. The only reason it is a film is to reach a broader audience, and in keeping with that goal, it had to suppress the unsettling and ugly truths with procedural jargon and run-of-the-mill pedestrianism. The result is a film with enormous cultural implications which in only seven years has been all but forgotten. A woman under the influence, while largely unknown almost 50 years later, is still bursting with life, relevance, and truth. <laughs>